Welcome to the inner source for cloud infrastructure management. You can hear me all right, right? Yeah. Yeah. I want to make sure. Great. Um, I'm Douglas Flagg, and I have, and I am a uh, principal software engineer at Fidelity Investments. I've been in my role about two years now. I have the pleasure of introducing Brooke Bishop. She is a director, cloud engineering, also Fidelity, and she's been here what, 25 years uh, now. Yes, 25 years at Fidelity. A little longer than me. <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to say, save the questions for the end. We will leave time for that. I don't think there's another presentation in here after this, so maybe we can sneak some extra time for those questions. Um, might be helpful to have a little bit of background in IAC, but we, infrastructure as code, but we will try to define some terms to make that easier. And this audience doesn't need to be specific to IAC. If you just want to make your inner source practice a little bit better, you're in the right place. We'll, we'll help get you started. Let's. Uh, so just a little bit of a roadmap on what we're going to be talking about today. So we'll give some background on Fidelity and how it's set up. That'll become important later. Uh, we'll have a shared understanding of what our technical jargon is, what we'll be using throughout the presentation. Then we'll go into what uh, our central challenges we're trying to, to fix with, uh, with uh, our inner source practice. Then we'll talk in detail about our inner source practice, the why and the how. And, uh, after that, we'll talk about some different inner source development models that we've found uh, work at Fidelity. And then finally, we'll talk about what's next and what we're working on. All right, so for those who don't know Fidelity, um, we have, our company supports over 42 million different customers. Um, and it's not just our personal investing, but we also have our clearing and custody servicing teams um, that we work with over 3,600 different financial services companies. We also have over 2,300 employers um, that manage their benefits through Fidelity Investments because we have multiple different business lines. So if we just take a quick look there. So obviously, um, just to kind of talk through this, the personal investing and institutional services is kind of an area where I support. I actually am part of the Fidelity Brokerage Technology, which is, serves up a lot of the back-end brokerage processing. Doug works for, um, it's called CAPE. I know everybody hates acronyms, but that is the Cloud and Platform Engineering Group. Uh, what we're really gonna show here is, like I said, there's, what, 70,000 employees at Fidelity with multiple different business units, and we're really just starting to figure out the best ways to pull all these different business units together to talk so that we have a common solution. So I'm gonna move on to you. Oh, great. Uh, so let's get a shared understanding of some of this technical jargon. You've probably heard these terms before. They very often get overloaded. So we wanna make sure that we have a single understanding here for this presentation. So what is InterSource? InterSource is software where the source is kept private to within your organization but it is freely accessible to all the technical roles within that organization. It's generally solely owned by the organization, so licensing really isn't an issue internally, at least. Um, infrastructure as code, or IAC, we'll be using that a lot. Um, that's just defining your infrastructure um, in source, just like you already do with your application code. You're probably doing this too, but just in case you're not familiar with it. Uh, finally, Terraform. That is our uh, an very common open source IAC tool that we're gonna be talking about throughout this. Um, use it to manage your cloud and manage infrastructure. Um, also important to note that while a lot of things, we at Fidelity try to default to inner source, not everything makes sense to have in, as inner source. There might be some things like your super secret recipes for your trading algorithms or your financial models that you might not want just everyone in your organization to be able to see. But that's more the exception to the rule than anything else. All right, so as a large enterprise, we've been actively adopting cloud since 2016. And we've really achieved some large scale cloud adoption with over 6,500 applications that have migrated to the public cloud. Obviously, we're a huge company, there's still probably just as many to go. I don't even have a number on how many to go. Uh, but given our scale, we're on a maturity journey. We have to ensure standardization, security, and reusability that's gonna enable us to continue to scale and simplify our cloud adoption. And like I said, HPU 
is kind of at a different state of their cloud maturity. And in order to accomplish our goal of getting to this standard, standard secure, and reusable point, um, we really needed to work together to enable our best intersourcing strategy for infrastructure as code. You're back up. Sorry, we're going to do a lot of back, back and forth switching. So let's try to simplify that challenge with an analogy. Um, so let's consider each business unit or cloud or SaaS provider, so think like AWS or Datadog or New Relic, as you're a city on a map. So think like traveling salesperson problem almost, but we're not going to move from one place to another. We're going to connect all of them simultaneously. So our goal is to connect all of those cloud or BU cities to each other efficiently. If we use a cloud service provider specific IAC solution, um, you might think of this as a railway. It goes directly from one point to another. It's pretty static. It is really convenient for getting to those places, um, but it isn't as easy to use a railway as it is to use a highway. Think of like cloud formation or ARM. Um, Terraform is roughly our highway, where we can travel between any point at any time. Makes it super simple to get from one place to another. Uh, and so because we have these finite resources and construction materials, finite time, um, connecting those cities, we want to be as efficient as possible. That means less infrastructure to maintain, support, and secure. Um, so in our past, we had every business unit basically doing whatever they wanted to get from one place to another. So we needed to consolidate all that so we didn't have so much duplication of effort. So given those objectives and constraints, how can we make this better? We think that it's better to build multi one or just a few super highways to connect to each. So each Fidelity city connecting to each other and then connecting to those super highways, then getting into the cloud. And that's our core and common infrastructure. So why the highway over the railway? Well greater flexibility for the travelers, our development teams, because they just get to decide at any point in time, we want to use this, we'll go there right now. And, and so that highway decision is a strategic decision Fidelity has made to, to follow Terraform. And that's where we, we point our development teams and where we've decided to build the infrastructure around. Again. All right. So. Based on our decision to adopt Terraform as an enterprise strategy, we had been working on the whys and hows of best implementing intersourcing for our IAC. So first, we want to encourage collaboration, right? This is the why. We want to encourage collaboration and contribution to the intersource projects by both individual developers and by teams. We'll get into that. Um, both audiences really bring a uniquely different and um, valuable types of contributions. More users that naturally discover and adopt the best common tools mean that the tools will benefit from more developer feedback, bug, bug fixes, and really just, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and it gives them greater ownership of the shared software. The inner source projects are critical because they enable any individual or team to contribute back fixes and features to common solutions. Standardization and reusability help to improve our efficiency and increase the quality and security of our IAC by ensuring resources are maintained and held up to a consistent standard. Then there's the how, right? This, I think, is everybody's problem, right, is how. How do we do this? Um, one of the first things we needed to do was identify a preferred technology solution. We've kind of mentioned a few times, at least for IAC in this case, we're really working towards establishing um, Terraform as our preferred technology solution across the, the firm. Um, we needed to define a contribution model with guidelines and security compliance, um, as well as defined roles and responsibilities. Um, we need to promote with, through communication and documentation. Communication is key, especially in such a large organization with so many different business units. And recognize and incentivize. So, I found that our teams are really, when we're called out as a great partner and a great supporter, you know, our team really feels that you know, they feel good about this and they, they want to be part of that solution. We also don't want to keep going through this, everybody reinventing the wheel. I mean, I think a lot of folks probably run into this a lot. Um, back to you. Cool. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about our different inner source development models that we've found at Fidelity. 
and we found work well for us. Um, and which model you choose really depends on what outcome your organization wants to achieve. So that first model right there, the centralized development model, that's our most uh, top-down model. This is created by the central BU, the one that I'm part of, we'll call the Cloud Engineering Business Unit. Um, and this is done for use by all the other business units if they choose to follow this model. So they could choose this. And uh, some of the pros that they, what we see when we, uh, when we use this are, it's easy to standardize because you just have one or a few patterns that they can follow. Um, it, this group is trying to serve the entire organization. A great example of where we use this is when uh, my group, the Cloud Engineering Business Unit, built the Terraform HTTP backend. Um, some disadvantages you might see here is because they're not super close to what the individual business units or development teams need, if you're not careful, uh, the solutions you build here may not meet the business requirements. Um, so, it's actually yeah. kind of how we ended up where we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that one has uh, some definite drawbacks. They all have drawbacks for sure. Um, our second one in the middle there, the organic business need. Um, these are solutions developed by the individual business units for use within their business unit. Um, these are really close or much closer to the actual problem. So it's much easier for them to make trade-offs between saying like, we want this amount of standardization versus this amount of uh, specification on exactly what they're doing. Um, and of course, because that's so focused, you don't have the, the problem of knowing like, what are, my, uh, what are my business rules and what do my developers know how to use because you're so close to the problem and there's a really specific problem you're trying to solve, not everyone's problem everywhere. A great example of this is the brokerage business unit. Um, they developed TerraCore and the associated Terraform modules. That was uh, something that they've used and we've actually now found work for a lot of other business units because they were trying to solve their specific use case. Um, some of the drawbacks here is these tend to, can sometimes not be easy to standardize or reproduce elsewhere. And, uh, and it can be sometimes too prescriptive. Um, yeah. And then our final model here, the maintainer's model. So this is a group that's appointed or self-organized around maintaining an existing project. You see this a lot with open source projects. Um, normally we see this infidelity only used for more mature projects that don't have a lot of active development going on, although it can happen. Uh, decisions are normally reached by consensus among those maintainers, and it's the, probably the most organic or bottom-up model. You don't, one of the big advantages of this is it doesn't necessarily require dedicated resources, just interest by people to maintain it because you have that group of maintainers, but it also relies on those maintainers to kind of guide the contributions of individuals that want to change the project because they're really not there to add features. They're just there to, to kind of get people to contribute, right? A great example of where we're using this right now is we have several Terraform providers that we maintain internally, and these are maintained by a group of maintainers using that last model. Um, I guess I kind of noted it, but to be more specific, uh, one other disadvantage here is that uh, because there are probably no dedicated resources, new feature development can be very slow on this model. Important to note that no model is perfect in every situation, and uh, some definitely perform better in some times. Uh, and projects can transition from model to model. We're actually gonna get into some examples on that next. So going back to our analogy with the uh, infrastructure and the highway, what we actually have as the highway is the Terraform HTTP state backend. And this was a strategic decision made to pave the path, or the highway in this case, and that state backend is what's enabling everything else. So if you're not familiar with Terraform, having a state backend, super important for actually being able to use Terraform effectively. Um, we set this up kind of to make it far easier for all business units to be able to adopt this. This was done by the, that central cloud business unit, following that first model, the centralized model. Um, it was completely developed and maintained by that centralized team. Uh, 
And this involves setting up that back end, an onboarding process, and RBAC controls. Uh, and we currently have 1,200 applications and 16 different business units using it. Um, so we, we get a lot of them. I think I'm three quarters of those. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next, another big part of making that foundation was the having some Terraform providers. Um, and these Terraform providers really are, in the analogy, the exits to our highways. Wouldn't be a very useful highway if you could only go get on it but never get off it. Uh, these really allow access to a lot more locations along the highway, so that the APIs, so if you wanted to go to all kinds of use internal services that are accessible through APIs, having these providers is super helpful to be able to, to access it with your Terraform. Um, the original development of most of these providers, or the, at least the best used ones, was done by FBT Brooks organization, that brokerage group. And uh, as we, we found many more teams using Terraform, we found that because they were relying so much on these providers, a transition was really necessary to standardize and, and make these more digestible by every group. So they came under the uh, maintenance of the central group, and that's the, the cloud business unit. We then took those providers, tried to make them somewhat consistent, put a, a good build process around them. And then once they were in a part where everyone could easily consume them, then we made one final transition to that maintainer's model. So these really went through the the whole life cycle as they aged. Um, and, that's, and that's now where they are maintained. Uh, and hopefully, those maintainers keep them mostly bug free and stable. All right, I think I have a lot of talking here, so bear with me. OK. So for, as far as enabling inner sourcing, um, really one of the big things was ensuring that we had standards. So our IAC standards are a version document that where we define the standards we've adopted concerning infrastructures, code usage, and development. We have delegates from all our major business units um, that are represented, represented, and their opinions are heard when we propose new standards. Uh, currently, these standards really are just the best practices, and there's not a formal enforcement, but monthly we're meeting to you know, continue to get this process through. So some standards that we have adopted, especially in my area, we're, the, we're one of the, probably the most mm -hmm. uh, mature areas using Terraform, um, you know, are software versioning schemes and how it should be applied to the modules and the providers, as well as testing of new modules and standardized tagging. It also codifies a shared understanding of how we define model maturity so that at a glance, users of the Terraform modules will know how many of these are actually mature. Um, as far as sharing modules, and you know, we're gonna loop back to kind of our, um, our analogy. So we have our rest stops. Um, oh, and I guess rules of the road, sorry, I missed rules of the road, um, kind of your driver's ed book. My son just started driver's ed this week, so he's got his driver's ed book. But that would be kind of your IAC standards. But the shared Terraform modules are kind of our rest stop, right? When you have a rest stop, you don't have to stop. You know, you, rest stops are out there so you can rest and refuel along the way. And every journey would need to plan to bring all their own fuel and their resources for their trip. Using any of our pre-established Terraform modules to take care of those details and run the common cloud resources will just make everyone's trip easier. Uh, just like we don't have to worry if there's going to be a gas station along the way. We know along the highway there's a gas station, right? Even if you have to get off that exit. Um, the brokerage team created and maintained many of the shared modules that have the largest share of usage. Like I said, I think we've been on this journey a little bit longer than some of the other business units because we were at a point where we needed to um, really get to the next level from our pipeline perspective. Uh, we've been focused on modernize, modernizing our pipelines and ensuring that our IAC is standard and meets security and audit criteria. Um, there are many other common and shared modules that have grown organically from the other business units. Um, and the catch here is no one at Fidelity actually regulates where the rest stops can be built or what amenities they include. And that's why we've started you know, working through, as a working group, some of these IAC standards. Um, but this is also a more open approach so that we can continue to encourage module innovation where the best modules hopefully kind of bubble up to the top just by usage. Um, 
You don't always know which rest areas are good. If you've ever driven down 95, you, you're like, I am not stopping there for the bathroom. I'm going to stop. wait till the next one. Um, so you don't know which ones are the best ones and which ones are to avoid. So we've been working on you know, kind of our travel guide and lists to promote which Terraform modules we do find to be the most useful. Um, so this travel guide really, you know, all of these Terraform modules are eligible to be cataloged. We're doing this in Backstage. And the Cloud Enablement team, Doug's area, has also created a common landing page for all these Terraform-related tools. So there's a common landing page for our providers for our, and all the modules across the company. Um, this is where developers can easily discover these modules and providers that they may need. Some, like we said, some modules are promoted through a higher maturity rating and other various methods. Um, and Cloud Enablement still kind of keeps, you know, a finger to the pulse here, you know, working with us to set the standards and, you know, kind of as a centralized team, bring everybody together. So then there's the fast lane. So Doug mentioned TerraCore. This is what we've dubbed. Um, it's kind of our process and procedures and the tooling um, around the brokerage pipeline using Terraform and Jenkins Core. So TerraCore, we're really, you know, we went all out on naming there, but. <laughs> Hey, it works. If you say TerraCore and Fidelity, most people will know who you, what you're talking about. So, but we modernized our standard pipeline, and we're considered kind of that fast lane now. It lets our business unit users get bootstrapped into using Terraform and deploying the workloads with a minimal investment of time or need to understand the technology underneath. Now, I have people that are like, yep, just tell me what I need to do, what I need to input, and we're sending that there. We have other um, developers in our organization that actually want to get more into the details of what's going into the Terraform files. So we see a little bit of both, but we're really giving them that fast lane in. You know, it was created as a simplified, opinionated way to deploy our common infrastructure as code, you know, um, through common Terraform modules and our Jenkins pipelines. And it's configured to use business unit man managed modules um, so that we can comply with SOC 1 um, controls. So I think everybody here probably has to deal with that. So. Um, the TerraCore process and the associated modules are all built by us, originally for use within our business unit, but as but we, we're actually seeing widespread adoption. Um, I know actually CAPE uses them. Yep. Um, some of our larger um, customer-facing organizations use them. Um, so it does show that the developers do find value in what the process is and what the pipeline is there, and they're feeding back into us, right? We're doing a lot more collaboration with all the other business units to really get to the next level. Oh, so uh, if anybody was here for the previous one, they had five C's. So, but I do have to say, our C's were all the same. <laughs> um, and, and the one that they had on top of really this was kind of culture. In the, what they had said at the end of their presentation really resonated with us too. It, it's establishing that culture for yeah. inner sourcing, right? Yeah. It's bringing together the like-minded developers to seamlessly contribute to core and common, focusing on simplifying, standardizing, reusing, <laughs> and leveraging what's out there. You know, we do this through pull requests. We do GitHub issues, discussion working groups, and different forums to give teams the ability to review and to um, and to inner source back in. You know, and, but we, we did have core maintainers in here, and you know, that's that mix of application owners and engaged parties to really ensure that the standards and the focus are maintained. I mean, that's key. Okay. Cool. Uh, so w what's next, and uh, where do we still have some challenges that we're still working on? So we found that ownership can still be problematic when you have the most frequent contributor to a project not also be the owner of that project. I think they talked about that a lot in the last presentation. Um, still something we're, we're dealing with. Um, additionally, dependencies between teams. When you have different inner source models, like uh, one team that might be centrally maintained or a, or a business unit trying to get something done right away, relying on a group of maintainers that just kind of does it in their free time, that can sometimes be a problem too. Also, duplication of effort. We still see many Terraform modules being created where existing modules would be just fine. Um, yes. Something, probably a perpetual issue. But we are, we are working on it by having a catalog so at least people can discover and not be unaware. And thank you so much for, for listening, to our, uh, listening to us. We want to hear, though, back from you 
about what you are doing well, in your cloud journey or if you're in the cloud and uh, how you use Intersource, what you found works, what you found doesn't. So we'll open it up for questions. Thanks. We're that good Any that questions? there was no questions. <laughs> Do you want three questions in there? Oh, three, yeah. It's, I was like, oh, well, man, the OSPO one go for it. Them. Um, so have we worked with the OSPO on this for the inner source projects? Not really, and that's probably two different, for two different reasons. One, our process is still somewhat immature. There's a lot of process around getting things externalized. And two, I feel like maybe a lot of teams have built things specific to fidelity, or maybe we don't see where we think there'd be value outside. Though that could be wrong. Maybe we just haven't looked into it enough. But the process is just a little bit too much right now, maybe, and that's why. Yeah, and, and, and I think just in general with the inner source processes, we've actually had in the past probably three, four years, really had a bunch of different initiatives coming through. This was just, IAC was just one of them. But we've got multiple other areas where we're really trying to push it. Uh, we have our pipeline library. We're waiting for an observability library, which is where different folks are contributing back in. And we're still seeing this a lot. Yeah. And it's, it's, really, it's starting to grow. It's starting to gain more traction. You know, the business units really are starting to really come together and talk because, again, I, I said it before, but you know, no one wants to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. And that's what was happening. But we're really starting to come back together now, which is good. So. There was a second part to your question. And there was, yeah. Well, you know, I'm kind of looking at when you talked about the insurer standardization, mm. yep. right? I mean, there's so many different groups that are working with tools and technology that they like because they know it, yep. but there's so much overlap in what you can achieve with it, mm. and then so how do you determine how to bring it together, you know, in a way that ensures the standardization instead of just the opposite? Yeah. Uh, I kind of have a comment here. So one thing, one reason why I think this is really working in a kind of roundabout way probably answer your question, is we're getting hit, and probably not the only ones, getting hit with a lot of TLM initiatives right now. So everybody's way that they were doing cloud, they actually are kind of in this spot where it's time to move on. So because of the timing here, we've really been able to bring that back. And because of the work that we've already done, people are seeing that value. Now as far as it's, you know, we talked about like, S, like an S3 module, right? Mm -hmm. An S3 module is an S3 module. Maybe there's some little tweaks here, but nothing that, you know, it's pretty consistent across the board. So there's no reason to, to have 17 different mm -hmm. modules out there. Yeah. I forgot where else I was going with this, too. There was something else I was going to say, but if you have something to say, I'll think about this. Uh, I, I guess you talked about standardization. I'm not sure if you were also asking about, like, how do we enforce that? I would say, at least at my level, where we're across the entire organization, there's definitely no stick. We, we, it's just carrots. We just want to encourage people to do things a certain way by building tools to make it easier to go the way that we want them to go. And that's why we built things around our strategic direction. No, your answers make a lot of sense. I think, you know, it's conceptually all of this is wonderful. Yep. I think to bring, you know, the challenges that are faced as you continue to mature are some of the challenges. Yes. Mm. So that conversation could go on forever. Yes. <laughs> Great question, thank you. Anybody else? All right, no other I, questions? Okay. Yeah. Cool. We're here all night, just like everybody thank you else. Guys. <laughs>